stocks all around the world are tanking. Planned to injure and kill as many law enforcement officers as they could. Paris terror fear, multiple people are reported killed in a shooting. So how did Flint's water supply become contaminated? The whole world is The whole world is The Zika virus continues to spread. Dozens of people pulled from their homes, their cars. And a look at the fight against ISIS. Our enemies are plotting against us. This is an economic disaster. Terrorists who are going to come to Western Europe and come here and kill us. But from there, 23 years in the Muslim world, seven in Pakistan, and then working as an area director overseeing missionaries in the heart of the least-reached area of the world called the 1040 window, which is a little bit to the east of the Middle East, all the stans of the former Soviet Union, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, 10 countries we oversaw our missionaries. And then, as Pastor said, leading global initiative, where our team of veteran missionaries would travel all over the world, 43 different kind of locations, to equip and mobilize the church to reach Muslim people. And one of the things that I saw in all of these travels was that what I would do in Pakistan or in Kazakhstan or in Turkey or in Egypt to engage a Muslim, that when I was back in the United States for meetings and so forth, I would do the very same thing in engaging a Muslim from whatever part of the world they had come from to our country. But here's a revelation that I had that them coming was just not a mere move on their part to a better life, whether they were pulled for opportunity, such as education or work, or they were pushed here because of poverty, famine, war in their own context. I began to realize that Muslims coming into context of freedom from places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, where I've been, where we have great difficulty in even living and being there because of visa situations, but God opens doors and enables us, that God was bringing them so that the church in freedom could engage them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know some of us have feelings of fear and anger and indifference towards Muslim peoples, but we have to allow ourselves to be transformed by the power of the word and spirit so that we can have a kingdom of God perspective as to why people of other religions are in our midst. And as a follower of Christ, and as you are a follower of Christ, or as you're considering to become a follower of Christ, we'll give you a heads up. It's so that we can engage them with the love of Jesus. And engaging them with the love of Jesus then opens up the door for us to be able to speak to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mother Teresa said that the first step of love is kindness. And I find that people have great listening ears when we are kind to them and loving towards them. And that's just as true for Muslim people as it would be of people of other races, ethnicities, and even a gender identification. As we reach out in the love of Christ, that's the way to begin to open that door. I do a lot of ministry to women and men that have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of my former students who now pastors LifePoint Church in Clarksville, Tennessee, had me come. He said, Mark... The men and women I church that have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan have troubled marriages and they have troubled family lives because of their hatred for Muslims. Can you come and do something to help me with this? So I did. We set up a seminar and I looked out in the faces of a lot of these men and women who were at the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. And the look on their face was the last person I want to hear from is this missionary, this do-gooder to Muslims. But I began with this story because I said to them, you know, as you may dislike Muslims, I equally have a reason to dislike Muslims. Because six months after 9-11, which we were living in Pakistan during 9-11, the Al-Qaeda bases were literally 200 miles away from our home with my wife and my three children. We had to evacuate. We came back to Chicago, to our home church. We were living in missionary and residence housing. I was getting ready to go preach. All of a sudden, I get a phone call from my colleague who served with me. We started Teen Challenge in Pakistan and had two church plants that grew from that effort. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready to go preach. He said, turn on the news. They bombed our church. And I immediately knew who they were. They were Al-Qaeda. 
And so I went to the television, I turned it on, went to CNN. The first thing that appears on the screen is the front of our church in Islamabad, Pakistan. And I see people being pulled out on gurneys, on stretchers, that I worship with every Sunday with white linens over them and their blood seeping through. I said to my wife, Linda, Linda, I'm not going to preach this morning. I'm going to call the pastor and tell him I can't make it. Get on the phone. Get me back to Pakistan as fast as possible. I need to go start doing member care in that church. As I went down the stairs to get my luggage, I got halfway down the stairs, and I had this rage building inside of me that I had not felt since before I became a follower of Jesus. I'm in a blinding rage, a rage that I had never felt revenge before like I felt at that moment. And in that rage, I stopped halfway down those stairs and I just said verbally, I just stopped and said, those dirty bastards. And as soon as I said that word, bastard, I felt the finger of the Holy Spirit stick into the sternum of my chest, like I feel it right now. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I died for those terrorists. I didn't have a kumbaya moment. I didn't have waves of love. I didn't get goosebumps. I just felt deflated from the anger, and I just simply verbalized back to the Lord audibly, yes, Lord, you did. And I walked down, I got my luggage, and I flew back to Pakistan. But listen to the words of Jesus and what he says to this church. And what he says to this church, though it was 20 centuries ago, is just as relevant to Southwest Family Fellowship this morning. So let us have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying to the church. Jesus says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, and angel could be the messenger, the pastor, it could be a literal angel, we don't know for sure, but it means the one who is speaking the truth and serving this church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. There's a house church movement that's moving throughout Iran that is transforming that country. They say that there are now up to one million Muslims who have now left the religion of Islam and now following Jesus Christ. One million. So when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the peace of Tehran, because that Islamic nation is changing from the inside out because of the body of Christ engaging Muslims and sharing their faith in love. This all started when Edward Hosepian and his brother Hike, who were the Assemblies of God superintendents, decided that we are now going to have our church focus on reaching people that are not from a Christian background or from any other background, but we're in the midst of a Muslim country. We're going to reach out to Muslims. So that's what they started doing. And now 90% of the Iranian Assemblies of God is now Muslim converts. 90% are Muslim converts. And so... When Brother Edward one day was approached by the authorities and he was told, you must not allow your churches anymore to do this with Muslims, to engage them, to share the gospel with them, to visit them. He said, we can't do that. It's in our theology. It's who we are. Jesus calls us to share our faith as the body of Christ. And he said, well, if you do that, then we're going to take away your church buildings. And Brother Edward said, go ahead, take away our church buildings. We don't need buildings. The church isn't a building anyway. The church is people. You take away a lot of overhead. You'll save us a lot of money if you take away our church buildings. So take our church facilities. We don't care. And he said, okay, if that doesn't threaten you, we're going to throw you in prison. He said, go ahead, throw us in prison. I've been in prison. Most of our pastors have been in prison because of false accusations or because we've been witnessing to Muslims and seeing them come to Jesus. So throw us in prison. You know what happens when we go to prison when we go to prison, we start sharing our faith with prisoners, and they listen to us because they hate you. So we plant the church in prison. And then he said, okay, if that doesn't threaten you, we will kill you. 
He said, go ahead and kill us. And then he named off pastors that had been martyred. The word martyr means witness. The ultimate testimony is to die as a martyr and to not give up on the claims of Jesus Christ. And so he named off Ramtin Sum and Mehdi Dibaj. And then he mentioned his own brother, Hike, who I mentioned, who when he was the superintendent of the Assemblies of God was apprehended on the way to the airport, stamped 29 times in his chest and his heart was dug out. He said, go ahead and kill us. You know what happens when you kill us. We only become stronger. We only grow faster. And then he quoted Tertullian, who in the second century in the Roman Empire was going to put him to death, said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You see, this is what's happening in Iran today, where there's a Shahaba Natasha, where there's a Cyrus Merriman Golnoush, whether it's a pastor Muhammad, there is a church that is growing exponentially in that Islamic nation because no government can tell the church to die and go away. No government, no religion can tell the Holy Spirit, you cannot bring people to faith, you cannot heal, you cannot transform lives. It's impossible. It can't be done. And so these are days of open doors that God is calling us through. And these are days of open doors in our own communities to engage Muslim peoples. So I encourage you, put off the fear. Put off the anger. And above all, the greatest sin of all, the indifference of I don't care. That's the worst of all. Because with fear and and anger, at least those are emotions that can be transformed and dealt with. But allow yourself to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and watch what he will do in and through you and through this church. God bless you. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this. And, and, and again, Kurt and I this week, said we just want a physical, tangible way to do this. And, and, and the best way to do it is to say, let's, let's yeah, we're going to partner with our church in, in getting on board with Texas Refugee Services, and we're going to put some skin in the game. We're going to, uh, as, as you said, kindness is the first step of, of love. And so we're going to show kindness uh, to some people. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said one time, you know, when you did it to these folks, you actually did it to me. When you did it to people in prison, when you did it to people that were uh, runaways and refugees and, and hungry and, and naked and thirsty, when you gave them uh, a little water or something to eat or those things, he said, you did it to me. And so that's why we're called to do this.